Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're going to continue with our study of the book of Job. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies on Job, I, I'll, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, I think this book in particular, it's very important to get the context. Uh, the first couple of chapters, if you don't get understand what's really happening, you can come to horribly wrong conclusions about it. Uh, but um, uh, I ended last time uh, on chapter 29. I read it in the KJV, and I intended on going through it slowly in the Amplified, and, and, I, and now that's where we are now. So uh, tonight I'm going to ask Brother Eric to start off by, if he would, read the KJV chapter 29, and then we'll go through it more slowly in the Amplified. But first, uh, let me, I better change the setting here. I forgot I got to turn cameraman on, uh, which is the feature that allows us to... Um, People who may want to join the conversation here, they don't get in automatically until I see who it is. Okay, that's all set up. Okay, our uh, brother Eric, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. It's me again, the Hall Mo. I'm coming to you live from my chief security officer safe house, incognito. Okay, back to you. Yeah. Okay, brother. Uh, if it's all right with you, read chapter 29 in the KJV. Uh, then I'll just get your overall thoughts on it. Then we'll go through it slowly in the Amplified, okay? Okay, that will be fine. Job chapter 29. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. When his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, when I washed my steps with butter, and the rock poured me out, rivers of oil, when I went out of the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street. The young men saw me and hid themselves, and the agent arose and stood up. The princes refrained talking and laid their hand on their mouth. The nobles held their peace, and their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard me, then it blessed me, and when the eye saw me, it gave witness to me. Be, be, because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe, and a diadem. I was eyes to the blind, and feet was I to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not I searched out. I break the jaws of the wicked and pluck the spoil out of his teeth. Then I, then I said, I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days as the sand. My root was spread out by the waters, and the dew laid all night by my branch. My glory was fresh in me, and my bow was renewed in my hand. Unto me men gave ear, and waited, and kept silence at my counsel. After my words, they spake not again. My speech dropped upon them. And they waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. If I laughed on them, they believed it not, and in the light of my countenance they cast not down. I chose out their way and sat chief and dwelt as a king in the army, as one that comforteth mourners. Okay. All right, um, that was very interesting listening to you reading it. Uh, I'd like you to give me your impression, just the overview, not not really 
diagnose, di analyzing it verse by verse, but just the basic overview of your impression of the chapter. What, what is he, uh, the main point there? Well, it's quite obvious to me, Brother Luke. Uh, lo uh, look at me. I was just about to say the Lone Ranger, and that's because this awfully a lot reminds me of the Lone Ranger. Because <laughs> uh, he's a stand-up guy just as well as Job was. Okay, back to you. All right. Um, well, uh, my first response to it as a, in a general way is that um, his visitors, the three men that visit him, for many chapters now, they've been accusing him and condemning him and blaming him, uh, saying he deserves all the problems he's got. And the problems he has, of course, is that his family's killed, his wealth is taken, his health is taken. He's just totally distraught. And they're blaming him and saying, you're getting what you deserve. And some of the things that he says in here are diametrically opposed to what his so-called friends have said. They said, you're wicked. You never helped the poor. And, you know, for example, and, and, and then he says, no, he always helped the poor. So... Um, Joe Ball Long has been defending himself from against all their accusations. And in here, he's lamenting and saying, oh, I long for the good old days. Before my troubles fell on me, my life was so great. I was respected. I was admired. Uh, people were waiting for any word around my mouth. And uh, so, uh, and now he's just totally disdained by these three friends. They, they're really looking down on him and saying, you need to repent and beg God for forgiveness because you're evil and w wicked and, and that's why this is all happening to you. And yet, we know the truth. We read chapter one and chapter two. We know that God is not punishing him, him for his wickedness, but Satan is doing it uh, because of the agreement Satan and God made in the beginning where Satan said, I've looked around the world and there's nobody loves you. You're not, you're not loved. And, and he, he, God said, well, what about Job? Have you, have you considered Job, my righteous, loyal servant? And he said, well, Job is so blessed. That's why he loves you. If you, if you let me take away the good things, uh, he'll curse you. And, and that, that was the arrangement that God made with Satan. And so, first of all, the bad things that are happening to Job are not because he's wicked. It's not punishment for wickedness. And second of all, it's not God that's doing it. Even though God allows it, it's Satan that's doing it to him. So we, we know that from the first couple of chapters, we understand that. And when you read the rest of the book with that in mind, uh, it's totally different. Uh, a viewpoint uh, of, of everything that's transpiring. Uh, even Job doesn't understand that his problems are not a result of, of God punishing him. Job doesn't even understand it. He wasn't there at the meeting with Satan and God. His so-called friends, they don't understand it either. So they're all scrambling around trying to analyze why this is happening to Job and what he has to do, and, and they're all wrong. Even Job doesn't understand it. Uh, so that's my reaction. He's longing for the good old days before his troubles hit him and, and recalling what his life was like before. Before I go on, what's your reaction to that? Well, that just uh, made me think, uh, Brother Luke, uh, it begs the question, at what point do we give up trusting in the Lord? At what point do we stop believing in God? And I think Job answers that question. What do you think? Well, that's one of the things that we learn from this book. And uh, there are people, though, that when troubles fall on them, uh, they do lose their faith. Uh, and, you know, of course, uh, I've... I've uh, taught and argued for years now that a person cannot lose their salvation uh, regardless of 
if they get like the prodigal son, they go off and get into trouble and get in the pig's pen and, and they still remain the man's son. They don't, their status as son does not change. They don't lose their salvation because of bad behavior. And some people say, well, what about someone who no longer believes? Uh, don't they lose their salvation? And we know that the scripture says that uh, uh, even if we have no faith, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And, and, and so Jesus uh, keeps us in the palm of his hand. No matter what we do, he won't let go of us. Uh, so if someone does lose their faith, they don't lose their salvation, but they lose their joy, they lose their assurance, and they maybe will not be building up treasures in heaven. But uh, uh, so if you're someone watching now and you've lost your faith in the past, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a salvation question. If you had faith at one time, you've received eternal life. You've been regenerated. You're a child of God. And yet if you lose your faith, it's a sad thing. One of the tr most tragic things in life is for someone who is saved to lose their faith. Um, but Job is inspiring to us because at no point in the story do we ever see him losing his faith in God. He questions God. He cries out, why me? You know, but he won't curse God and he, he doesn't lose his faith. Uh, I'm going to go in, into it more carefully now uh, in the Amplified, uh, but let me, you, will you want to respond to that? Uh, well, let's just go ahead, I guess. Okay. Now, as I'm going through it in the Amplified, if you're comparing it to the KJV, if you see anything that really is, uh, really needs to be uh, stated as far as the difference, then uh, let me know. Because as everybody should know now, I am a KJV firstist. I consider the KJV to be the scripture, and I consider the Amplified to be like a commentary. All right, so 29 verse 1. By the way, in the Amplified, it gives us uh, the benefit of a, a title of each chapter. It's the, the publisher and translator's opinion about what the chapter is about. And it says, Job's past was glorious. That's the title. It says, and Job again took up his discussion and said, Oh, that I were in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. As I was in the prime of my days, when the friendship and counsel of God were over my tent, when the Almighty was still with me and my boys were around me, when my steps through rich pastures were washed with butter and cream from my livestock, and the rock poured out for me streams of oil from my olive groves. Uh, I, I'll stop there, uh, even though he continues on uh, reminiscing of these good days. But that was pretty interesting, wasn't it? Uh, he cites, one, his... Um, friendship and counsel of God. His boys were around him talking about his children. And then he even talks about his livestock because his, his, his family's killed and his livestock's destroyed. And yet we haven't even talked about his, 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 uh, you know, bad health. Okay, brother, what, what's that? I did notice they, uh, instead of putting children, they put boys. Uh, scripture did state that, uh, Job had daughters as well, and so I sort of left them uh, hanging in a way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I um, maybe they took the position uh, that um, that is is prominent in the scriptures that uh, men are valued uh, more than women. Uh, you know, in throughout the Bible. We, we see that a man uh, is entitled to the inheritance, particularly the firstborn in a family, the firstborn male. And, and the women are, uh, their importance is to marry and be the head, uh, the, the, the wife of the head of the household of the, of the other, the new family. 
Um, so maybe that they are looking at from that perspective. I don't know any other way, reason why they put boys rather than children. Anything, anything on that? Uh, it's still a mystery, but uh, I forgive them. <laughs> okay, let me go on then. Uh, verse 7, when I went out to the, to the gate of the city, when I took my seat as a city father in the square, the young men saw me and hid themselves. The aged arose and stood respectfully. The princes stopped talking and put their hands on their mouths. The voices of the nobles were hushed and their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouths. I'll stop there. He continues on in the same vein, but let me stop there for a moment. Uh, so he's, he's describing his standing in the community before this bad things happened. Brother, what's your reaction to that? Well, that Brother Luke, that reminds me a lot of my career working for the man. Uh, I was very successful at what I did. And uh, I kind of a lot of times got the same reaction from my peers. Wow, that is really very impressive. Uh, uh, so, so I don't understand the part when it says young men. What does it? How does it phrase it? Um, a young men saw me and hid themselves. The aged arose and stood respectfully. I wonder why the young men saw me and hid themselves. And it also says it in the KJV, young men saw me and hid themselves. There's no uh, change in the translation there. Uh, what does that mean, do you think? Young men saw me and hid themselves. Well, we know that those young men most likely admired and looked up to Job. And so uh, when they saw Job coming, it wasn't just anybody coming. It was somebody to get out of the way and let pass through. Okay, back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm wondering about the young men, if it's, uh, if it's referencing someone that was, let's say, you know, uh, 15, 20, 25 years old, or if it's younger, like young boys were children, uh, they seem like they run and get out of the way more if they're children, according to the way that you see it. Uh, but it also says that uh, princes stopped talking. That's in verse 9. The princes refrained talking, it says in the KJV. Uh, princes, I mean, so you see, Job was so highly respected that not only the elderly would st stand and out of respect, that the young men would step aside for him. The princes would stop talking and hold their hands over their mouth and not talk to, they'd want to listen to him. That's how esteemed, how respected, and how much in awe everybody held Job. So I, I think we can probably see uh, when when God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And, and, and Satan says, well, yeah, but look how much You've blessed him. He's been blessed with, I mean, maybe part of it is also because of Job's uh, intelligence, hard work, uh, and uh, uh, part of it is because of, you know, uh, the, uh, the fruits of his, you know, you reap what you sow. Maybe he worked real hard for everything he's got, but he was very successful. So successful that princes even admired him. Almost like he's a king in the community. That's how wealthy and respected and admired job was and now it's all crumbled down no children no no uh uh what is it called not flock but what's the word um uh livestock yeah it's uh let me see cattle livestock yeah it says uh, he talks about his livestock or his cattle. And so he doesn't have the livestock. He doesn't have the uh, the children. 
And of course, we know that I don't know if he'll continue on talking about his health. I don't remember if he mentions that, but his health is horrible. His health is so bad that a lot of people would probably kill themselves. His wife told him, why don't you just kill yourself? His health was so bad. He had boils that were extremely painful, and they were from the soles of his feet all over his body up to the top of his head, boils. It was a horrible uh, sickness that came upon him that must have been very painful and a lot of suffering. So all these things happened to look how far he's fallen in every respect from the status that he held before. All right, then I'll go on here in the Amplified. It says, verse 10, the voices of the nobles were hushed and their tongues stuck to the roofs, to the roof of their mouths. When an ear heard my name mentioned, it called me happy and fortunate. And when an eye saw me, it testified for me approvingly. Because I, okay, he's going to go on and talk about the good things he's done. But, but it goes on saying that how, how much he is admired. Uh, and because, and it says, when an ear heard my name, it called me happy and fortunate. I mean, wouldn't he be happy? I mean, um, Jack Smack did a video recently titled, uh, talking about happiness. And, and I think he was talking about happiness is a temporary state and it is based upon, uh, you know, um, um, like material and, and uh, physical things. Good health, plenty of food, plenty of, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, money. All these things contribute, friendships, all these things contribute to our happiness. But joy, joy is a result of our, our uh, blessed assurance of salvation, our relationship with Jesus as our Savior. That's where we get joy. But uh, this says here that everybody considered joy. He was very a happy man. And why wouldn't he be? You think you'd be happy if you had joy's, uh, I mean, uh, Job's status before uh, his uh, decline? Oh, yes, absolutely. And uh, by the way, joy does make me happy as well. Yeah. Uh, someone, uh, I, I don't know where I either heard this or maybe I just thought of it. Uh, but uh, uh, I took the word joy. I might have a video on this someplace that I made. But I talk about joy and I said, if you really want to have joy in your life, then the word joy tells us how our priorities should be in life. And the J stands for Jesus. And, and let, let's, let's, let's make Jesus the focal point of our life. Let's, I have a, a, a video titled, Let's Stay Focused on Jesus. You know, when we wake up in the morning, the first thing would it would be wonderful if the very first thought in our minds, oh Jesus, thank you for this day. That's what I said this morning, not to toot my own horn here, but that's how I actually opened my eyes and woke today. Thank oh Jesus, thank you. And maybe it's also because today was the first day of me being a senior citizen. <laughs> you know, I turned 60, 65 yesterday yesterday, and I woke up today and say, hey. You've given me another day, Lord. Thank you for yesterday. It was a wonderful birthday, a wonderful day celebrating my birthday. And today I'm happy you've given me another day. But that's how I woke up. And and not that I'm perfect at this by any means. But if Jesus is the focal point in our life, that's the beginning of joy. The next thing, of course, is what about other people? This relates to what you love to bring up is this royal law. And, and that is that you, we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, the, and, we, and we love our neighbor. We love others. Uh, so that's where this word joy, J-O-Y, it fits in right in with that principle that let's love God. Let's think about Jesus. Let's make Jesus the focal point of our, of our lives. And then the next thing we need to think about, what about other people? 
I want to love them. I want to try to serve them. And then J-O-Y, the Y stands for yourself. Third on that list, the final thing on the list is ourselves. Okay, if I'm thinking of Jesus and then I'm thinking about others, the last thing I really need to be thinking about is myself. And I think that we will be blessed if our priorities are Jesus, others, and then ourselves, uh, then yourself, if we're going to follow the acronym of J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and then yourself. Uh, guess what? The yourself part is going to work out very well because we are going to be so blessed because we focused on Jesus and, and loving others. Um, so that's why uh, when you say joy, uh, then that is the difference between joy and happiness too. A happiness, you can be happy for a moment or for a day and happiness is fleeting. Joy in that respect that I described it, I think is, is a constant state. Any reaction to that brother? That was a beautiful way to put it. I love the way you explain that joy. Uh, joy is such a special word to me. To me, it represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The J represents the cross. The O represents the grave. And the Y represents the resurrection. Okay, back to you. All right, brother, let me read on here. Continuing in the Amplified, verse 12. Now, I remember in previous chapters, his friends accusing him of not helping the poor and the widows. And here in verse 12, he says, I rescued the poor who cried for help and the orphan who had no helper. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me. And I made the widow's heart sing for joy. So here he is. Uh, probably a part of this is a response to his accusers who were previously calling him wicked. And he, they're saying he did not help the poor. And, and he's claiming he did. And I, I, I personally think Job's right. I don't, I think uh, the reason God used Job as an example and said, well, Satan, you can't find anybody in the world that loves me? Well, go look at Job. Have you considered Job? Examine him. Because God knew that Job was righteous in that respect, that he loved God, his faith was in God, his salvation was based upon his faith in God. Uh, to me, all these years I've read Job, uh, um, in the past, uh, the thing that stood out to me in this study, this current study on Job, that made me really happy is a verse that says, Job said, God has put all of my sins into a bag and sewn it shut. And that, that verse made me very happy because it, it made me conclude that Job had the same viewpoint on his salvation that we do in that uh, because of his faith, his sins would not be held against him. Uh, and I think that's why he was considered righteous. Uh, and yet, uh, here when it says, uh, so he's, he's correcting his accusers and saying he did help the poor. He did help the orphans. And in verse 14, it says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. What's your reaction to verse 14? I think that's a very interesting verse. Yeah, Brother Luke, we can definitely ascribe that verse to our salvation in Jesus Christ, can't we? Yeah, it's... Uh... I can't think of an exact verse right now, but in the in the New Testament writings, we, we do find this uh, principle that we are clothed in his righteousness. We put on a white robe of righteousness, a covering from Jesus. And uh, the first example of this covering that I can cite is in Genesis, when uh, Adam and Eve 
sinned and then realized they're naked, they knew they needed a covering. So what they did was they decided to go to work, get fig leaves and sew them together and cover themselves up. They, they wanted to work at covering themselves, work at solving this problem themselves of the nakedness. And, and that's a picture of man's effort throughout history of trying to work and, and, and attain their own righteousness, their own covering. And, 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 but God rejected that. He said, that's no good. I'll cover you. And he, and he provided them with animal skins as a covering. And the animal skin, and there, you can't have an animal skin unless there's a death, unless there's blood. So the animal skin was the first indication that man could not work at covering himself. He needed God to provide the covering. And later on, by the end of the, the book in Revelation, we see the pictures of the, the white robes that were given. This rep representative of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we put on. And here we have Job talking about God providing a, this clothing for him. Brother? Amen to that, Brother Luke. Uh, okay, back to you. Okay, I'm going on. Uh, I'm at uh, verse 15. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. So he's, um, in other words, he, the, the blind people, he would grab them by the arms and lead them around and be their eyes. The lame people, they couldn't walk. He would help them move about, providing transportation for them. I was a father to the needy. A father takes care of his children, and so he, the needy people, he helped provide their, for their needs. I investigated the case I did not know and assured justice. So he was even like the, 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 the judge of the town or the community. And, uh, you know, 17, and I smashed the jaws of the wicked and snatched the prey from his teeth. So he provided uh, judicial decisions and, uh, and uh penalties for lawbreakers um verse so I'll, before i go to verse 18 what's your response to all that yeah he definitely sounds like he was uh a pillar of the community okay yeah it sounds like he was not just a pillar the pillar he was like, he was above the princes. Uh, I don't know. He, there's no reference of him being called king. But it, really, from everything you read here, it seemed like he was like the, the king. Or uh, That's how, uh, it, 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 if we were told that he was king, this would all fit with a description of how a king is. Uh, verse um 17, and I smashed the jaws of the wicked and snatched the prey from his teeth. Then I said, I shall die in my nest and I shall multiply my days as the sand. So he was content. He thought he had basically everything. There was, he didn't lack anything. And he was just perfectly content at just letting his days play out. Uh, and uh, he had a comfortable, beautiful, comfortable home and everything he needed. My root is spread out and open to the waters, and the dew lies all night upon my branch. Now, I don't know verse 19. Maybe you can tell me about verse 19. Uh, I think it's referring to his uh, stability uh, that was in his life, having his root spread out by the waters. And the dew lay all night upon my branch. Uh, well, that might be some sort of a saying back then that made sense. Uh, but I'm not quite sure what exactly that would refer to. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know either. Uh, uh, this is just... Further proof, if you need need proof, that uh, I, I am not uh, omniscient, I'm not infallible. 
I don't claim to be able to explain every verse in the Bible. I, and unfortunately, I've run across some people on YouTube that are, I seem to be so arrogant that they, they think that they must have every verse right and that uh, they have the need to correct everybody and because they, they're so conceited that they think they got everything right. Well, in my case, I, I can't make that claim. Look at this verse here. I mean, neither Brother Eric or I claim to understand it. I mean, we could take a guess, but I don't have a lot of confidence in it, in, in my guess. Verse 20, my glory and honor are fresh in me, being constantly renewed, and my bow gains ever new strength in my hand. They listen, verse 21, they listened to me and waited and kept silent for my counsel. Hmm. This is just, he's just so impressive. I mean, the more that I learn about Job here, it's just remarkable. And, and uh, for, those of us, for those of you who have not watched this series from the beginning, you're probably not even aware because I, I would never really realized about Job's age. Uh, in this study, we, we learned that Job was relatively young compared to his accusers. The three men that come to visit him that are supposed to be friends and continually accusing him, um, they're the ones that are elderly, and Job is relatively young compared to them. And so I'm estimating that Job was, you know, 30, 40, 50 at the most. And, I, you know, in the years past, I, I assumed that Job was an elderly man to, to achieve so much. So he was... I mean, gosh, how successful is Job? And to have everything taken away from him, how crushing that could be to someone who has so much. Anything before I go on? Yeah, Brother Luke, I don't remember. I must have been uh, absent of that session where we discovered that Job was a younger person. Well, Brother, I remember how you talked about being faithful uh, in your ministry and uh, you, you apparently you weren't faithful that day. You were somewhere else. <laughs> um, you, I guess this is a good, uh, a good uh, reason for you to go back and watch it all from the beginning and and, and find that point because I I can't recall exactly where it is, but. Uh, Go back, watch it from the beginning, and you'll see. Um, it says, um, verse 22, After I spoke, they did not speak again, and my speech dropped upon them like a refreshing shower. They waited for me and, and for my words as for the rain, and they opened their mouths as for the spring rain. He's... I mean, he just so admired anything that Job had to say, people wanted to hear it. Verse 24, I smiled at them when they did not believe, and they did not diminish the light of my face. I smiled at them when they did not believe, and they did not diminish the light of my face. I'm not sure how that fits or what that means. Look. Let me compare it to the KJV. Verse 24 says, If I laughed on them, they believed it not. And the light of my countenance they cast not down. So they couldn't bum him out. They couldn't bring him down. Uh, but what does it mean if I laughed on them, they believed it not? I don't know what that means. Now, I had a thought, and it seemed to me if I laughed on them, they believed it not. That would be like if he was smiling at them, they were like, oh my gosh, she's smiling at me. <laughs> okay. That may be, be the case that he was, it's like today, you know, I don't know if this is really a good example to use as a comparison. But um, uh, this year, uh, a few months back, 
we had a very famous person come to America that a good portion of Americans just absolutely love and worship. This is a person named Francis, and uh, I call him Dope Francis. Uh, his Officially, they call him Pope Francis, but I, I don't respect uh, any pope, and I don't respect the whole concept of popishness and the, uh, the papistry, or if that's the right word for it. Uh, but this man is so loved by so many people that they were just hoping that they could touch him. They were like, so many people were in tears just to be able to see him. And if, you know, if he smiled at someone, oh, they just they remember it for the rest of their lives and, and just be the, such a thrill of having even eye contact with him. And that I even heard from some of our leading politicians in America. <laughs> I, I was shocked. Grown men and women going goo goo gaga over Dope Francis. And that's what you made me think about when you said, well, they did, maybe they're reacting because they're just so happy that if he even like smiled at them, that they're like all fawning over him. Is, is that the way that you uh, meant that, brother? Uh, yes, brother Luke, absolutely. And that's a good, uh, very good analogy. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Dope Francis does not deserve any any kind of uh, um, admiration or, or, or respect or certainly not worship or idolatry at all. Um, he only deserves the, the kind of uh, love and respect we have for any person that is lost that we would like to lead to Jesus so they could be saved. So he certainly doesn't deserve that kind of uh, adulation. Uh, but uh, Job's case, uh, he doesn't deserve it either. Some people are admiring him, but Job's not perfect. And even uh, I remember Peter and Paul and now and, and Job here. There's examples of these people being almost worshipped. But when Peter and Paul were worshipped, they immediately put a stop to it and said, don't worship us. We're just men, just like you. We're not to be worshipped. And, uh, and even when angels have appeared to men and people want to start worshipping, the angels stop them. Don't worship me. I'm, just, I'm a messenger. I'm not God. Don't worship me. Only God should be worshipped. But did you notice that someone else on earth was worshipped? And he accepted their worship. And he, he, he is the one that really deserves our worship. You know who I'm talking about. Absolutely, Brother Luke. Uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is worthy of all our worship. Amen to that. Okay, back to you. It is the responsibility of every mere human to never accept that kind of idolatry or worship or adoration from other people. That kind of reverence is should be reserved for Jesus. And that's why another thing that really makes me angry is the title that some people take as Reverend, the Reverend Al Sharpton, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. I'll tell you what, I don't revere them. I revere Jesus. He's the only one that deserves our reverence, our adoration. For any man, any, any mere human to take the title of Reverend, that I'm to be revered. Is, it makes me sick. But in this case, Job is, is, seems to be almost idolized uh, because he's so respected and admired. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's the end of chapter uh, 
29. Uh, I don't think we should begin another chapter. Um, let me just, uh, we'll, we'll do an invitation for salvation as, as usual, but before we do, I would just ask you to just uh, kind of recap the study for today in your own words and, and uh, any, anything that stood out to you is really particularly interesting. Well, now Job is uh, talking here, and he's talking about his past, how glorious it was, and uh, his standing in the community, and uh, he was very highly, uh, so much so, we suspect that he may be, have been the ruler of his community, which uh, I'm not sure if we can confirm that or not, uh, but uh, he's definitely way up there at the top. Okay. Uh, and uh, basically, that was about the whole chapter was about uh, him reminiscing on his glorious past. And uh, I think that's what the whole chapter was about, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, um, I don't remember. <clears throat> See, when when we do these studies, brother. By the way, if, if you're probably aware of this, but maybe some people who watch my videos may not realize it. <clears throat> uh, over the years, when I've made a video on my own, not a hangout, but just a uh, where I I feel led to speak on a topic. And what I do is I do a little preparation at least, and I'll make an outline and I'll, I'll try to make a, a kind of a lesson plan. And, and even if the video is going to be five minutes or 30 minutes, uh, uh, you know, I want to organize it and I want to prepare and I want to do the best job possible. But these hangouts here that we're doing here on Job and Proverbs, the, the Gospel of John, early church history, these are the four... Uh, subjects that we're, we're alternating our studies and I'm not doing any kind of preparation for it I'm just kind of as we go we look at it and I'm just kind of being surprised myself I I don't know what is to come and this chapter here it really has been interesting to me in that I didn't realize uh, the I mean I've read I've read all of Job before in my life numerous times but I don't recall the details of how great Job was I mean I knew that he was a very wealthy man but this chapter here better than anything I've ever read about Job tells us his true greatness in all these respects and uh, and and when you can see the height and then the fall the great despair of, of such loss better than probably any place else you realize now how far he's fallen how much he's lost so we really get perspective of the the gravity uh, of his loss and it should give us even more of a respect for you know his ordeal and how he deals with it because uh, even though even though he's discouraged and he even wishes he was dead at some points, uh, he, he never stops loving God. He never stops believing. And he certainly never curses God the way that his wife told him to do it and the way that Satan predicted he would do it. He never does that. Uh, so it, it's really very amazing. Someone who had so much and he had so much taken away that he, he his love and his faith remains intact. Uh, any final words on that before I, we make an invitation for salvation? Well, I think that Job is a great example of how all of us should uh, be in our faith. Uh, Jesus uh, once said, uh, when he comes back, well, he asked the question, will he find faith on the earth? And uh, he would, if Job was here. Okay, back to you. 
Okay, very good. All right. Um, in all of our studies, Job, Proverbs, John, uh, early church history, or for that matter, any theological topic and any book of the Bible, no matter what we study, it's beneficial. But there's only one thing that is critical and essential, that, that is of utmost importance, that rises to the top of all subjects and all questions, and it is salvation. And it would be, it would be uh, negligent on our part, brother, if we, if we neglected to tell them the one thing that they must learn, that they must understand, that they must believe. So we're not going to be negligent. Well, as usual, we'll end the broadcast answering a couple of basic questions. And uh, uh, what do you have to do? What do you have to do in order to go to heaven? What must you do? You know, who is Jesus? You know, what what is what did he do? What is important to understand about Jesus? These are the things that we want you to understand. The, st the starting point, though, is to correct the biggest error, the biggest lie that's ever been told. It's the it's the heresy, the false philosophy that the world as a whole holds now and all through history. And that is the belief system that somehow man can earn salvation. That uh, when we die, God will judge us based upon our goodness. And those people that are good enough, God lets them to heaven. And those people who fall short and not quite good enough, they don't go to heaven. They go to hell. That's been the pr predominant, I'd say probably 95%, maybe 90% in the world of the people in the world today. That's what they believe. If I ask someone, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Almost every person will say, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I got my fingers crossed. I'm hoping and uh, I hope I'm good enough. I mean, after all, I am religious and I do uh, follow the golden rule. I even follow the Ten Commandments. I was even baptized and I go to church regularly and I do all kinds of good things. I try to help other people and see, they're, they're playing their case for their salvation based upon what they do. They say, I did this, I did that, and I hope God approves. But the Bible says in Romans 10, 3, people are trying to establish their own righteousness to get into heaven, but that's not God's way. You cannot get into heaven through personal merit. That's... The, 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 the first thing that you need to understand, that's the big lie that needs to be refuted. So every religion in the world is based upon personal merit. So you could join any religion and try to follow the religion and you're not going to get into heaven that way. You could join all the religions. You could be the most religious person in the world, follow all their religious tenets, and you're still not going to go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says we don't go to heaven because of our own righteousness, be, because of our own works or religious works. We go there because of our faith in our Savior God, Jesus. So you don't go to heaven because of what you do. You go into heaven because of what Jesus did. You don't go into heaven because of what you do. You go into heaven because of what you believe in it, who, in who you believe, in whom you believe, Jesus. We don't get, we don't go to heaven by behaving. We go to heaven by believing. I hope you're getting the contrast in these two, two ways. One way through religious work and personal merit, 
That's the wide road that almost everybody travels. And Jesus said, that's the wide road that leads to destruction. The narrow road is the narrow, the road that very few people ever believe in. And that is that personal merit can't work. And I, that's why I need a savior. That's why I need somebody to save me because I'm in a, I'm in a terrible predicament. My works are like filthy rags in the sight of God. That's what the Bible says. That's what you need to understand. You need, need to reject the principle of working your way to heaven. Reject it. And once you reject it and, 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 and say, I'm defeated, I surrender, I cannot get into heaven through my own efforts, I need to be saved. Then you need to understand who the Savior is. The Bible says there's one Savior. Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I'm a way. He didn't say, I'm one of many ways. He said, I'm the way. He said, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. So Jesus claimed to be the only way to get into heaven, the only way to receive life everlasting, the only truth that you need to accept. And he even emphasized and said, you can't get there any other way but by me. So reject personal merit as the way and believe in Jesus as the way. Trust him. Now, I want you to know who he is and what he did. The Bible says he is God who became a man. God manifest in the flesh as a man named Jesus. Uh, it says that he died on a cross to pay for our sins. It says that he was buried, proving he was truly dead, and it says he was raised from the dead on the third day. So you need to understand that he is our God and Savior, and that he did pay for our sins. Now sin is not a, a, an obstacle because a man couldn't go to heaven and be with God because God's perfect and man's sinful, so there was a barrier. But Jesus paid for the sins. The barrier is removed. Now man and God can come together because of what Jesus did, paying for our sins. He paid for all our sins. But the exciting thing is that he raised himself from the dead on the third day. And the, the reason that is so important is because the Jews kept demanding that he give them a sign to prove who he is. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the Savior, the Messiah. They said, prove it. Give us a sign. He said, the sign you get is that if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it on the third day. After three days, I'll raise it. He was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. They also, a later time, they demanded the sign. He said, after he'd already done uh, like all these miracles, they demanded a sign, even then. And he said, the only sign I'm going to give you now is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That represented his death, burial, and resurrection. He promised that he would give us a sign to prove that he's God and that he has power over life and death, and he did it. He, he was raised from the dead bodily, and he walked on the earth for 40 days, 500 witnesses, saw him, touched him, talked to him, ate with him. And this resurrection is the sign that proves that our faith in him is justified. So I'm confident that my faith in Jesus is justified. I hope you're confident now and you'll put your faith in him. If you put your faith in him, he gives you eternal life in heaven as a free gift, and it's promised to you. Because Jesus promises it to you, you can count on it. It's guaranteed because the Bible says he cannot lie, he cannot break a promise. So please put your faith in Jesus right now, and then make a comment on this video so that, so that we, we know that you've done it. All right, brother, brother Eric, any last words before we close? Uh, thank you, Brother Luke, for inviting me. I pray that all our viewers will 
take uh, careful consideration what was said about the good news of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the only way and it's their only hope. He is their only hope for eternal life. Okay, thank you. All right, Brother Eric, thank you for joining me again tonight. Uh, anybody that's watched the video, thank you for watching. And uh, join, join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.